Hello, my name is Ken Kinter. I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University. And the purpose of today's presentation is uh, part four of the group facilitation series. And this focuses on legal, ethical, cultural, and moral aspects. So before I get started, I just wanted to uh, give some credit where credit is due and talk a little bit about the project that I work for. Uh, it's known as the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative, which is an academic affiliation between Rutgers University and the State Psychiatric Hospitals of New Jersey. Our mission is to improve the quality of care and the working conditions at the state psychiatric hospitals while introducing evidence-based practices and the principles of psychiatric rehabilitation. So the, this whole thing is made possible by financial and other types of assistance from the New Jersey Department of Health. Uh, we are grateful uh, for all of their assistance without which none of this is possible. So as far as this presentation, we're gonna be talking about the legal, ethical, cultural, and moral domains of group counseling and the issues that very often create quandaries or dilemmas between those domains, such as confidentiality, informed consent, involuntary membership, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna give examples of a couple of dilemmas where these uh, domains sort of clash and also talk about some resources for additional research if you have further interest in this uh, area. So first off, we'll talk about legal issues, and that's simply the minimum standards that the law will allow. Um, so for example, uh, mandatory reporting for child abuse or say Tarasov or duty to warn considerations. So failure to meet these standards would mean violation of the law, and usually implied in that is some potential harm uh, to the public safety. Next up is ethical issues. These are standards that are, are conducted by governing boards. If you belong to a profession of some sort, have some sort of certificate or license, these are the rules generally above where the law is that you operate by. So for example, I'm a member of the American Counseling Association. So uh, not only subject to the laws, but also subject to uh, these standards as well. Next up is cultural issues. So all of the different things that make people different from each other, ethnic background, gender identity, sexual orientation, all of these different uh, domains that make us all different from each other, but people that we will be working with in a group setting who bring not only their own unique backgrounds, but the, the values that come along uh, with that. Uh, an example of a cultural issue that may show up in a group uh, where I work, we do a lot of work around the adverse childhood experiences study and scale. And whenever we administer that, there's always some discussion that there are some groups of people. So the, the item of a child being physically disciplined to the point where it leaves a mark. Well, generationally and culturally, that is more and less acceptable depending on what group you're talking about. So what may be framed as traumatic in one group may be common practice in another. Uh, I'm not here to debate that one, just to say that it exists. That would be a good topic all its own. And last but not least are moral issues. And this is an individual issue. This has to do with your own sense of what's right and what's wrong in a sense of your, your own conscience. And we will talk about this one. I'm gonna ask you to stay to the end on this one because we hit the moral issues last and that very well could be the most important point um, of it. So let's talk about how these uh, domains interact with each other. So at the most basic level, we have the law. So if you don't like being incarcerated or you don't like being prosecuted or involved in the legal system, you are probably gonna do your best to adhere to the rules of the law where you are from. And of course they do vary greatly depending on where you are. One level up from that are the ethical considerations. If you wanna work in a certain profession, if you have a license or a certification, I'm sure you prize that because that is one of the things that helps you earn your living. So you wanna operate within the ethical standards of that given profession. Next up, and we're not gonna go into this in great detail, but it's sort of self-explanatory, your job has its own rules, policies, and procedures. And of course, if you wanna keep that job, you will have to adhere to those uh, to be able to keep that job. Cultural, we just talked about, um, the group membership and identification. So not only what group do you belong to, but how much do you adhere to the beliefs and values and standards of that group? Because of course, just because someone belongs to a group, that doesn't mean that there's a specific way that they operate either in group or just in the world. And then at the top of the pyramid here is this is the moral, this is the individual piece um, that's specific to you. And we'll, we'll revisit this uh, at the end. 
So the first issue that we're going to talk about how it affects these different domains are screening and orientation issues. And basically what screening is, is to, is in short, it's to see, is the group going to help the person and is the person going to help the group? And orientation is about acclimating new members to the group so that they know what's going on. Now, the reason we, we do screening is and orientation is that anything that can help has the capacity to harm. And in a group setting, again, you've got people coming together and there may be a clash of values, a clash of beliefs. So there is the potential for there to be traumatization or re-traumatization or, or just negative outcomes. And it's the duty of the facilitator to express that in advance so that people know. Now, in a perfect world, you get to meet with potential participants first so that you can explain to them what the group is and they can ask their questions of their own expectations and what their role is going to be. You want to address any fears that they have. Um, however, we do not work in a perfect world. Very often, the first time you see someone coming into your group is when you walk in the group and they're there or you're there and they walk in. That's very often how it works in a public setting. Um, so it's also very helpful. The, the helpful advice here, the hopefully helpful advice is written in red. You want to have a written guide. If you just have a one page thing that says, here are the expectations of group. This is what this group is about. Here's what's expected of you. Um, and then here's what you know you can expect of us. Very, very helpful. That way you have it on hand and they have it um, right off the bat because the idea that people don't know what a group is about threatens the chemistry of the group, especially when there's always new people coming in. So leader, facilitator, guide issues. This is also very significant because right off the bat, it addresses what is the role of that person going to be? And you see my uh, sort of vague language there. Leader and facilitator and guide can all be considered the same thing, or they can be considered different approaches to that role. I'm, I'm kind of fond of the term facilitator. I'm a little uncomfortable with the term group leader, because to me, you, you're trying to kind of collapse a hierarchy of groups so that people are on the same level. So the goal of a facilitator is to um, form the container, especially in the beginning of the group, maintain safety for everybody, respond to the distress of people, and to bring what the process and content is going to be of the group, to oversee that, of course, to maintain confidentiality, which we'll talk about in a bit. So there are a couple things that can complicate those primary roles of the facilitator. First of all, do you have multiple roles? Do you know the client from somewhere else? Anywhere you have a dual role, so you're also their case manager or you know them personally or any other setting, those two different sets of expectations at some point will clash. So dual and multiple roles are to be avoided wherever possible, but they're not always, uh, it's not always possible. Other significant issues for the facilitator are what is the facilitator's values and behavior? And is that going to cause them to clash with members of the group? So for example, if the facilitator has a, some, a religious-based opposition to say homosexuality, and you're gonna have LGBT people in the group, we have a potential problem. And if the facilitator isn't in touch with the issues about that and what role that does and doesn't play in the group, we've set the stage for, uh, for a problem. Uh, critical that the facilitator have their own group experience as a participant and also have some uh, therapy experience on their own, just to know potentially where their blind spots are. Who might we have negative judgments about? Who might we as facilitators have a lack of knowledge about or, or, a, or a, a belief that isn't rooted necessarily in fact, but in our own experience? What I found is that whenever I have felt that something is universal is usually a bad sign because it isn't universal for everybody. It's just universal to my mind. Other issues are the facilitator, how is this power going to be used? You know, is this a group where you're working with maybe children or in a correctional setting where you are to be the adult authority figure? Or are you in a setting that's much less formal where we have less use of that? As the facilitator, you bring a, a power differential into the room with you, whether you want to admit it or not, and how you choose to address it is going to significantly impact how the group goes. An example of this is self-disclosure and participation. You as a facilitator, how much do you disclose about yourself? Do you participate in group exercises or do you oversee? Important to know this in advance before walking in the room instead of making, uh, making it up. Because one, one of the important questions we ask here is whose needs are being met? Because this isn't about the facilitator's needs, this is about the needs of the participant uh, in the group. 
So again, helpful, hopefully helpful feedback here is supervision is key. You know, who, do the, who does that facilitator or those facilitators report to? Co-facilitation is also wonderful because now you have two people in the room that you can bounce ideas off of. And as I mentioned before, having your own group experience and your own therapy experience is invaluable. I think it's the single best thing you can do uh, to improve what you do. Um, and you will learn as much from what people do wrong that you don't like, as well as what's done uh, right. I know that's been part of my own uh, individual experience. So next up is informed consent. And this is basically advanced notice. Think about in the field of medicine, before you undergo a process, you wanna know what's gonna happen, what the potential benefits are and what the potential risks are. Same deal here, the nature, purposes and goals of group. Also discussing these issues that we're, that we're discussing in this presentation. It's an advanced notice of what's going to happen. It's always better if this is in written form and if someone signs that they received it so no one forgets what they've been told or weren't told something, that way you've got it right there and also for future reference. Uh, it is critical that when doing this informed consent that you are in touch with what the laws are, where you are, and it's very different for everybody. So I can't make a blanket statement about that. One of the real critical examples of, of this is consent for minors. What age is someone going to be when they can give consent? What age are they when they have the right to refuse information to go to their parents? This is all stuff you need to know and it varies from state to state and country to country. But in any event, it's critical that you know uh, so that you are not operating in violation of you know, uh, the law where you are. So where I work is in a state psychiatric hospital and people are there on an involuntary basis. However, people are encouraged to go to groups. So it's one of these little tricky things where can you refuse to go to group? Yes, but might that adversely impact things like your, um, you know, the rights that you have in the hospital, the privileges that you have in the hospital? Um, these are significant events. And, and I'm sure there are other settings in corrections where um, you have involuntary groups. So some of the rights that need to be discussed are, does a person have the right to refuse group? Do they have the right to withdraw? Do they have the right to attend but not participate without any consequence to them? Do they have the right to not incriminate themselves? If they say something, can it be used against them legally or clinically? They'll give you the example of working with um, sex offenders. So if a sex offender is having a really bad day and they're feeling really triggered toward children, does that get documented? How does that get handled? Because of course, confidentiality has limits. If a person has access uh, and can harm children, that's a duty to warn, you know, here where I am in New Jersey. If a person makes a threat to hurt themselves or someone else, similarly, we have to, we are mandated by law to report that. So those things have to be spelled out in advance because some, there's this line sometimes between voluntary and involuntary, which has a coercive flavor to it. Like you don't have to, but this is gonna go badly for you. That's, that's a rough deal. So that may call for some consultation on your side where you work, where are those rules and where are they rooted in the law and where are they rooted in at the ethical standards of where you are. Because it's entirely possible that you may be asked to do something in your job that may not line up completely with ethical or legal standards, certainly not moral standards. We'll talk more about that later. The, as far as trying to have involuntary groups be helpful, my stock line always is, well, look, you're mandated to be here. Is there something we can do to make this worth your time or help you get somewhere that you want to go? How can we make this helpful? If you have to invest the time would you rather get nothing out of it or would we rather come up with some way that we can make this helpful to you? Confidentiality is probably the biggest challenge out of all of these. Uh, I love the saying here from Benjamin Franklin, three may keep a secret if two are dead. Uh, maybe that's a cynical viewpoint of it. So the trick about confidentiality is that it cannot be guaranteed. Um, now you as the facilitator don't be, wanna be the one breaking it except for in those situations of limits, which we were just talking about. But it's worth mentioning regularly, as if it weren't in every group. 12-step meetings refer to confidentiality multiple times in a single group. You know, the old, what you see here, what you hear here, let it stay here when you leave here. That sort of thing. Again, clearly stating the limits to confidentiality, danger to self, others, or property, abuse of children or elderly, 
uh, legal ramifications if there's some body or some person that can request that information and get it. Uh, that needs to be known up front. Social media has the capacity to uh, take breaking confidentiality to a whole new level uh, in that anything can be instantly worldwide and permanent uh, once it's released. So that's an issue to bring up. Uh, what I would definitely recommend is to have a confidentiality agreement that people sign in advance. Again, it doesn't guarantee confidentiality, but you're doing everything that you can do to assert how critical it is. Confidentiality is a necessary ingredient to safety in a group setting, and people have to feel safe before they will do any sort of work or invest themselves in the group process. Really, really a critical point. So just to continue on confidentiality, now the issue of the minors comes around again. State and national laws may be different where you are. What are the laws where you are about where can a minor sign their own consent? Where's the place where a minor has to sign for consent but co-sign with a parent? And what rules do, do the parents have regarding releasing information to them? For example, uh, we have the issue where a, uh, a, a minor can consent to getting a drug screen, but then refuse the results of those to be disclosed to the parents. And that's a wonderful little ethical dilemma to run into when the parents say they're paying for it and they want to know. And there's a law in the way saying that they don't actually have the right. That is a message that you do not want to be conveying. There's also the issue of emancipated minors, where someone is chronologically a minor, however, they are treated as adults. So again, go to go to the law about that and definitely go to supervisors about that to find out what the, you know, what that is. And don't necessarily get go from the idea that, or this is our policy, this is our procedure. It's got to be rooted in something deeper than that. You would much rather get in a situation where your job is threatened than your professional standing or your freedom. So moving on into uh, diversity and multicultural issues, very, very significant issue here. Um, because as we are going, we are we certainly in this country and elsewhere are becoming more diverse. Now, the good news of that is, it's cool, more differences, there's more to learn, more to know, the world is getting smaller, but it also comes with challenges in that there's more to know and more to learn. There are way too many groups of people to know the cultural norms of everyone. And as we mentioned before, just because someone is a something doesn't mean that they adhere to all of the standards of that something. There are what we call within group differences. So that means that A, say black person's opinion isn't the black person's opinion, it's a black person's opinion, so on and so forth. So my strategy about that is don't pretend to know, ask. I don't know what it's like to be Hispanic or Latino. I don't know, so I ask. I don't know what that person's experience is with being in any of those groups. So I ask and I find out. I don't pretend to be the expert. Uh, back in the day when we got the multicultural counseling textbooks, there were little chapters about here's how you counsel black people, here's how you cancel, here's how you counsel Asian people, here's how you counsel Hispanic people. We're we're past that. We're, we're, that was a necessary step, but we're way past that now, where it's more about what's going on with that specific person. Um, a lot of group facilitators tend to be not representative of the populations that they serve. For example, many group leaders are heterosexual, white, middle class, very often male. So again, because that's the facilitator or leader of the group, that person's values kind of have an elevated stance. We don't want to enforce that. We, we actually want to eliminate that so that the values of the facilitator don't take precedence over the, uh, those of the participants. So we don't want to prioritize those values. We want to address that right up front. Be open about what you know and what you don't know. And we as the facilitators should be at least as open to learning, modeling that willingness to learn about other people as we ask the people in the groups to. And we have to be very careful about where our values align or clash with other group participants so that we can, when we do weigh in, we weigh in objectively with everyone's everyone having equal standing instead of, well, I agree with you, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your side. A couple places where um, multiculturalism is, uh, a, a, is of issue in a group setting. For example, the role of the individual. Like There may be certain individuals who are not comfortable discussing their family, or they may be not comfortable discussing things about themselves without their family present. That's culturally relevant for them. And that's something that we as group facilitators need to respect, have that person look at, that's a valued part of who they are. 
how can we work with that? Silence. Silence is very often construed as resistance. It doesn't have to be. It can be a person thinking. It can be a person processing a difference in cultural values from one to another. They may have to think about that for a little bit before they answer. Because values are almost like a language or another dialect. You might have to think about it and translate that into your own experience because it may be that different to you. Assertiveness. Some cultures value assertiveness more than others. Some more, a more of a reserved approach. How conflict is handled and resolved. There are cultural lenses in that as well. And also goal setting. How much of that person's goal is individual and how much of that goal is based more on the collective, on the family, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're, they're kind of home group, as it were the group of people that they work with. So one of the things that I love about group, uh, I love doing individual uh, therapy and I love doing group. Group has a couple extra pieces beyond what um, individual therapy does. And what it has to do is it creates an artificial environment. So without getting too deep into it, society has its own hierarchy. Anywhere you get a group of people together, a hierarchy forms. There are certain characteristics that move you up on that hierarchy, certain other ones that move you down on that hierarchy. That is a whole presentation unto itself, not today. The point I wanna make is that groups that have been marginalized, your job as group facilitator is to create an environment where that doesn't happen. I did groups in a jail, and it didn't matter what your charges were or how long you were there or your race or anything, everyone had equal standing in that group. And that took some doing because the hierarchy in a correctional setting is pretty fixed. And they even said, you know, this isn't how this is out there in the tiers in the prison. And I said, I know, but that's how it is in this room. When you come in the door, all that stuff goes. Much easier said than done, but critical. So you can give people a chance, people who have been marginalized, a chance to be in a place where they have equal standing with everyone else in there. And I think that is really critical. It's critical to address things like oppression, like marginalization, and the need for equality. If you can't do that in a group setting, in that container, in that period of time, that's going to be a real problem. I mean, those problems are going to exist in the world. How do you change those things? You change it one person and one hour at a time, and group gives you the opportunity um, to do that. So let's go back to the top again. You saw these, this list of things. Now, when we get into quandaries is when these things don't line up. Now, most of the time they line up. Something is good with the law. It's good with the profession. It's good with your job. It's culturally sensitive. And it also makes sense to you morally. But what happens when you get put in a position where these things don't line up? Your job asks you to do something that you don't see as being morally correct. Or if you're caught in a situation where what you're doing might not be in line with ethical standards or legal standards. So here's a process where we can look at that. A couple, couple details about that. One, and, and I like to assume the worst in certain situations. So if this situation, if this quandary you're in where you're not sure what to do and these things aren't lining up, if it goes bad and there's a negative outcome, and I've experienced this before with people I've worked with who've completed suicide or, or completed acts of violence, things along those lines, so first of all, did I do everything, look at it from the frame of the law? Did I do everything within the standard of the law? So if I had to explain my actions in a court of law, how would that look? How would that state? Especially thinking about a judge being there and an attorney whose job it is to discredit me. So did I do everything that was defensible within a legal standing? Same thing with ethics. If I had to explain this to a board, say the American Counseling Association, how would I defend what I did to them? And so, this was, so it would be in alignment with their standards. Vocational, and this has happened before where I've worked in jobs where my standards and the job standards were different, or I saw the job standards as being outside of the ethical and legal bounds. And that put me in a situation where very often what I chose to do was leave the job. Easier said than done, but better for me than staying in that job and, and compromising myself in the long, in the long term. Cultural aspects as well. It's an obligation for all of us to be as culturally sensitive as possible and to be able to work with as wide a group of people as possible, particularly those who have been underserved for, you know, for whatever reason or marginalized for whatever reason. And then we get to the top of this, the moral piece. So if you're in a moral, if you're in a moral quandary, you're questioning about what's right and what's wrong. So that's the part where you have to look very deeply in yourself. 
Because at the end of the day, even with the legal and ethical and cultural parts aside, you need to be able to look at yourself in a mirror. And when things have gone bad, the question that I always ask myself is, did I do the right thing? Did I do what I felt was right? Because at the end of the day, I'm the person that I have to live with and I have to see in the mirror every day. So even if something happens at a job or if I had to leave a profession or something like that, it's me that I have to live with. And I would suggest that same consideration for you. This is also where having supervision or mentorship or your own therapy becomes critical. Who can you bring this to? If you're in a part where you have sort of a moral, you know, maybe a blind spot or a distortion there or something where you're just stuck and you don't know what is right and what is wrong, who do you go to? Who is the person that you talk to? If it's a job, there has to be a supervisor that you can bounce this off of. Is there a mentor, someone who's further down the road, as I put it, someone that you want to be when you grow up, regardless of what age you are? a mentor, a supervisor, something like that, or your own therapist to do your own work if the source of this moral quandary has to do with you and somewhere you've been. Because this is what I've noticed. The things where most moral quandaries are are things that are very near and dear to us that we may lose objectivity over. That may be trauma-based, might be culturally based, any number of things. Who is that person you can go to? Don't go on the limb by yourself. Don't make these critical judgments by yourself especially if you fear that you may have lost some objectivity along the way. So in summary, group therapy, with all of the great stuff that it can do, uh, there are many legal, ethical, cultural, and moral domains, and there may be clashes between those domains. And those are, the, those are critical periods in someone's, uh, in someone's career, in someone's life. Knowing the laws, rules, and ethical standards are critical, and also knowing your own beliefs and your own values. And you have to know them before you can stop from imposing them on others. Supervision is critical, as we discussed. Don't go out there by yourself. Uh, you know, it's someone's well-being, someone's life on the line. Treat it that seriously. Um, group provides, I would say, a unique opportunity to help people by helping people see out of the box that they may, that society may have contributed to them being in, and see what is it like to be someone else. What is it like to be without all of those? restrictions that are there. By helping people, you help society. The, the last piece I would add is not only with supervision and mentorship, but a lot of these problems, as you've noticed, are avoidable if the work is done in advance, if you have the written informed consent right off the bat, if you have a confidentiality agreement, if you have that stuff ready to go, and that's easily borrowable from your employer or even from the internet, if you have this stuff thought out in advance, if, this, if you do this in the pre preparation part of group, which we have other videos about, you can prevent yourself a lot, uh, prevent a lot of problems in the long term. So these are the sources where I got this material from. These are, all of these are really great um, group resources. I encourage you to look them all over. And we also have the other videos on this site. Please feel free to watch the other ones. There's a lot of them on different mental health and addictions. Um, topics, as well as the three prior ones in, in this group. So um, I thank you for your time and you take care and I'll talk to you again soon.